Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Civica Data Science Seminars. So the Civica Data Science Seminars is a series of interdisciplinary forums of the Civica European University of Social Sciences, which is an align of uh, eight leading higher university uh, and research institutions in Europe. So uh, today we have great pleasure of welcoming Professor Lisa Singh. Uh, she's the director of the Massive Data Institute at the McCourt Institute uh, School of Public Policy and professor of the uh, Computer Science Department of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, she is also affiliated with the Institute for the Study of International Migration and the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Her research spans different areas of data-centric computing, and she's the co-author of Words That Matter, How News and Social Media Shaped the 2016 Election. So without further waiting, I give the floor to Professor Singh, who will be presenting her research about improving uh, understanding on elections with open data and surveys. And you can use the question and answer uh, chat to write down questions, which we will address at the end of the talk. So Lisa, thanks, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Pedro. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so thanks so much for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here. I am, by nature, because I'm a computer scientist, am a methods person. So uh, while I will allude to different things, um, uh, different types of possible theories and, and reasons for um, connecting what I'm sharing today, I am gonna focus a lot on the methods and the data we used and how we went about conducting different types of analyses related to the 2020 election. Um, so um, oh, my mouse has decided to, there we go. Okay, so let's get started. So we live in a world where people share a lot of views freely for better or for worse. Um, we uh, see users are sharing, oh, there we go. Users share over a billion stories each day uh, across meta platforms. They share over 500 million tweets per day and over 4.4 million, million blog posts are published every day. Um, out of 7.75 billion people in the world, um, 6 billion use the internet and 4.2 billion, which is over 50% use social media. So we are getting a huge um, number of individuals who are sharing their views and opinions. So while I have a lot of smaller questions I wanna answer, I have some long-term Uber questions that I'm interested in. So let's look at those for a moment. Um, how can we use all of these publicly shared opinions to be better understand the public's viewpoint on different issues? Um, what is the impact of traditional and social media on public opinion? And what part does misinformation play? So these are some of my long-term public opinion questions. And while I'm gonna focus on election 2020 today, many of the methods that I use and uh, measurements that I construct, um, I use in different contexts, such as forced migration, understanding online movements um, like the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matters, um, thinking about COVID misinformation and some others as well. So, so um, all of this research goes towards understanding these larger questions that, um, that I grapple with. Okay, so I'm gonna start out um, with work that was done as part of the Breakthrough Project, which was a collaboration between CNN, Georgetown, and, um, and University of Michigan. And I'm also going to start out by talking about surveys, um, because that's the kind of traditional way to get public opinion. We worked with CNN, and, and Michigan and Georgetown worked with CNN, um, and they uh, had a survey that sampled a thousand Americans per week from uh, July to mid-November during the 2020 election. It was a national sample um, run by SSRS, their omnibus survey, and we had a total number of 17,800 responses. And there were traditional uh, questions on there, like what's your political party and who do you think you're gonna vote for, things like that. 
But we, what I'm interested in looking at are the following questions that we asked. These were open-ended response questions. And the questions that were asked were the following. What have you read, seen, or heard about Joe Biden in the last day or two? And then the same question was asked about Donald Trump. And verbatim, verbatim responses were recorded by the interviewers. Okay, so, so this is going to get us um, thinking about how pe what information people are hearing about these candidates throughout uh, the election season. Okay, so the first question that we always wanna ask ourselves is, when does the public start paying attention to the candidates? Uh, and if we look at the number of responses, have you read, seen, or heard anything about either candidate? We see that in general, um, they have heard about the candidates. And in fact, um, for Trump, Perhaps it's hard not to hear him when he was president, but um, generally over 75% um, of the respondents heard something about him during most of the can during most of the campaign season. And um, similarly for Biden, later in the campaign season, uh, over 70% of respondents heard about um, something that he said or something about his campaign. Early on, uh, the numbers were lower. But those last few weeks, um, we were getting, um, we're looking at about, um, you know, 80% uh, in terms of uh, respondents hearing something. I always find it interesting um, that the day of the election, we never uh, get 100% of respondents hearing something, uh, which, 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 or very close to that. It always, I always find that um, to be very interesting. Okay, so now let's start with the very simplest of analyses. What words matter? What are people remembering about these candidates? Before I talk about the results of this, I wanna talk a little bit about data quality issues. Um, when you're working with open-ended responses, people, uh, people respond in many different ways. Uh, data collectors write their responses differently. There might be misspellings, abbreviations, data variations. And when we get to other types of data, like social media text data, there can be sarcasm, there can be spam. Um, we don't know how representative different samples are. Um, so these are issues we have to think about as we are uh, investigate or as we are using these types of sources. Uh, for this particular analysis, uh, we did the following cleaning. We exclude stop words. Those are the standard uh, words like the and and that would clearly be in many responses, but don't give us insight into the content. Um, we exclude something that we call flood words. Flood words are words that are specifically um, uh, specific to the domain of interest, but occur and don't give us additional insight into that domain. So examples of flood words would be things like Biden and Trump. Of course, they're going to say their names, um, but their names don't give us insight into uh, the con which topics or, or, or what it is that they are remembering about the candidates. Uh, we lemmatize words as well, um, just to standardize them. And then uh, we also create something called synonym lists. So for example, if somebody were to say Donald and were to say Trump, we might consider those two words synonyms. And therefore, when we see one of them, we would increase the count um, for the, when we see either one of them, we would increase the count for that. Okay, so... Let's look at, okay, so I'm gonna be the first to tell you, I really hate word clouds, but I'm gonna show you word clouds today. And why I am gonna show you word clouds is every time I create more sophisticated visualizations, it is the word clouds that people share with everyone. So um, I think the point is, is that they're simple and they're easy for people to interpret. So let's look at Biden first. Um, and if we look at Biden's word cloud, we see that no surprise, coronavirus is something that people cared about. Um, but we're really, you know, what is a surprise perhaps to some is uh, his vice presidential pick, um, uh, Harris, was talked about quite a bit. 
Um, and if we look at other words here, good country, debate, campaign, vote, these are all pretty standard um, types of campaign words. There are some negative ones there too, like dementia, um, sun, um, some of those are negative ones, but they're not overwhelmingly what people are remembering when we look at the entire period. Um, on the other hand, let's look at Trump. Uh, if we look at Trump, um, without question, uh, coronavirus was the main uh, the main thing people remembered about him. They remember different things about coronavirus. They remember his policies. They remember his masking. They remember um, when he got sick. But but the point being that um, that was the main thing that they remembered. Um, the, everything else is secondary. Uh, the debates, um, whether he's good or he lies, um, the economy, voting, they were all secondary to coronavirus. Um, at this point, I want to pause a minute and go back to 2016, because we did a similar analysis with Gallup in 2016, where we asked a similar question about Hillary Clinton and um, and Donald Trump. And I want you to see what um, Trump's looked like in, in 2016. So in 2016, uh, people uh, it, people remembered his campaigning, his rallies, his speeches. Um, they did also remember some of the negative things, like uh, like his uh, scandals with different women. Um, and even back then, there was some notion of election rigged that was being discussed. Um, but campaigning, which is a very traditional election time uh, word was um, was a good word for him as the main one that people remembered. On the other hand, if we looked at Hillary Clinton, um, without question, the thing that was remembered about her was email um, and uh, her investigations, the FBI. Um, and this was something through the campaign season that she could never get past. She could never get past the um, email scandal. And um, if we look, if we compare that to Joe Biden, uh, there wasn't some type of a scandal that was overwhelming through the period. But perhaps coronavirus was uh, the email counter for um, Trump in some way. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show why that sort of is true and sort of might not be true. So overall, if we look at the top memorable words that, uh, for Biden and Trump, um, we see vice president again on the high end for Biden. Um, coronavirus um, is 20% uh, of respondents through the entire time period mentioned something about coronavirus. Um, and then there's some negative words and there's some positive words um, that, that come up. Um, so the question is, are people feeling positive or negative with respect to coronavirus and Trump? Because it's so prevalent, uh, we wanted to understand that a little bit more. So we did a sentiment analysis. Um, sentiment is the process of determining the tone of a piece of text. Is the tone positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? There's lots of different approaches to sentiment analysis. Um, there's dictionary-based approaches, there's machine learning algorithms, um, and uh, uh, there's, there's now even more um, statistical learning and deep learning uh, models that have been produced more recently. Um, when we work with our collaborators uh, on this project, uh, because most of them are social scientists, they feel most comfortable with the dictionary-based methods, partially because you need to label a fair amount of data um, and vocabulary around sentiment in elections may change um, pretty dynamically. So, so we, for this particular analysis, um, use the a dictionary-based approach. And um, so, so let's look at um, at this um, at this analysis. So, um, so here, what we're looking at is we're looking at a sentiment impact score, which is the y-axis, and the x-axis is the date. 
we're taking all those open-ended responses that mention COVID in some way, and we are looking at um, uh, the impact of those. Basically, what we're looking at is the overall average sentiment of recalled news about Trump. Um, and we've separated this by party. So the red line is Republicans, the blue line is Democrats, and the gray line is independents. And so you can see that all the conversation about COVID-19 is not negative. In fact, it is. it does very much depend on, on the party. And there is a point where almost everyone is positive or neutral. And this is actually when he... Um, when he was diagnosed with COVID, uh, even, uh, you know, people would say things like, oh, I hope uh, the president recovers um, from COVID and, and, and open-ended responses were, were typically um, uh, positive or neutral um, at, that, at that point. Okay, so words are great, um, but topics can be more informative than words. Um, so we wanted to get some sense of, um, of topics that were prevalent through this time. Uh, at the time, uh, there were two types of state-of-the-art uh, unsupervised models. Uh, they were generative topic models. Most of you may be familiar with LDA. That's a very popular one to use and graph theoretic topic models as well. Um, Embedding-based topic models were emerging, but um, there weren't any that were performing better than um, some of the more classic state-of-the-art ones. Um, we found that they were not helping us with the open-ended responses, so uh, we went a little bit of a different route and we hand-created topics from the open-ended responses. Um, we iteratively identified frequently co-occurring words that were not in the topics that we hand created, um, and we would then decide whether or not they should be in the topics. We identified synonyms, we identified close proximity words in different word embedding spaces, and added whatever uh, additional words and topics we thought we should based on this kind of iterative process we have. And then finally, finally, we uh, label different responses. Okay, so um, so let's look at uh, at um, Trump first uh, and the topics that uh, that were most prevalent during um, during the election season. Um, and so I want to point out a few different things here. Uh, one, as we said, coronavirus was the most important word. Um, and we can see as the election, as we got closer and closer to the election, it became bigger and bigger. Um, perhaps it was that he could not get away from uh, this topic um, because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Um, taxes was another one that was there, racism and protests, uh, debates, um, negative comments, but everything else was secondary um, to uh, coronavirus. If we look at Biden, Biden um, has a really kind of classic campaign looking set of uh, topics. Uh, when he selected his vice president, that was the most prevalent um, thing that people remembered. Um, but generally people are remembering things like his convention, different debates. Uh, coronavirus is a steady topic because of course we were in a pandemic, campaigning, state of the race, um, there were also uh, a protest, Black Lives Matter protests that, that occurred that year, and both of them um, had topics related to that as well. Okay, well, I always like to do this look back to 2016 because I think it, it, it teaches us a lot about um, campaign seasons. And so if we start with Trump, uh, in 2016, uh, he, there were a lot more topics uh, that changed around and shifted around. In fact, I would go so far as to say he was the master of being able to switch the topic that people would remember about him. There was nothing that was consistently at the top all the way through. Uh, there were things like the uh, his VP pick, the conventions, immigration policy, um, different scandals, the debates, um, but but nothing nothing that stuck with him. No surprise when we look at Clinton, 
the things that were the largest for her, with the exception of the debates, were generally negative. So you have the email scandal, and this big bump is where when the Comey announcement occurs, um, and health problems. Um, that was at 9/11 um, uh, um, when there was a discussion when she left uh, an event early. Um, and so it's very interesting to see how the negative topics really dominated uh, what people remembered about her. Um, it's also now worth thinking about the current state of the art with topic models. And there's been a new class of topic models that have been generated, that have been developed that are called generative topic noise models. So one of the reasons topic models worked so poorly, um, like LDA worked so pro poorly on open-ended responses and on social media posts is because of the amount of noise that gets uh, connected to the topics of interest or the words of interest. So the noise frequency and the topic frequency can look very similar and nobody uh, thinks about that uh, noise frequency when they're doing their topic modeling. But these generative topic noise models actually focus in on not only understanding the generative process of the topics, but also of the noise. And so simultaneously, um, while uh, generating topic, uh, while generating the topic distribution, it also generates the noise distribution. These um, types of models, uh, I think, are actually going to be the future of topic modeling um, for us uh, to when we have noisy um, arenas of posts with short, noisy posts like social media. Um, there are three different flavors that have already been developed. One that's unsupervised, um, which is TND. But the weakness of TND is while it does a very good job with uh, identifying the noise distribution, its topics aren't quite as strong and intuitive. Um, so the authors there um, have connected it to LDA, which has very good topics, except for they're noisy, uh, to create something called noiseless LDA or NLDA that um, I think is gonna be the standard for topic modeling from these sources. Uh, GTM is a guided topic model, so you give it some seeds, and given these seeds, uh, it then generates a more robust topics, and then there's a temporal topic model version as well. And so if we apply um, these, uh, if we look at this, I, I forgot that I had this slide next, I would have shown this. So the idea is that these models um, produce this topic distribution over here, but it simultaneously produced this noise distribution so that those words that are really very prevalent, but very noisy, meaning that they seem to be frequent across a large number of topics get pulled out um, and, and they don't pollute the topics. Um, and so if we look at this um, on a Twitter data set, um, so, so I'm going to move for a moment from uh, survey data to Twitter data. Uh, on Twitter, we have three different data sets that we use for different parts of our studies. Um, one is based on a daily random sample of tweets about Biden and Trump uh, using the 10% Decahose sample. Um, one is uh, looking at debate hashtags. So we look at the debate hashtag um, uh, starting 30 minutes prior to each debate until 30 minutes after the debate. And then the other one is looking at major hashtags and keywords that are related to Trump and Biden and just pulling all the different um, uh, streams related to that. So from the um, kind of core daily random sample, we look at topics on Twitter really quickly. And what I wanna showcase here is two things. Um, one, um, COVID is still a prevalent topic here, um, and, and this is a combined set um, looking at both Trump and Biden. Um, debates is still very prevalent as well, um, but we do see some other things like people talk about conventions. Election integrity is something that people really talked about as well. Um, online more so um, than um, the discussions um, uh, that we saw in the survey responses. And extremism is also um, an interesting topic we see here uh, that we didn't see as much in the survey responses. Okay, 
I'm going to now shift to another type of analysis, and this is going to be stance. So stance um, refers to um, classifying a piece of text as either being in support of, in opposition to, or neutral towards some given target. Um, and so for our Biden-Trump example, I might have an example that says, I'm so happy Biden beat Trump in the debate. The sentiment of this post, because there are more positive than negative words, um, would be positive. The stance towards Biden would be supportive. The stance towards Trump would be opposing or opposition. So stance gives us much more insight into a uh, opinion of individuals as opposed to sentiment, but it is also um, a bit more costly uh, to, to, um, to determine. So in order to, uh, to label things with stance, uh, you need to use machine learning algorithms to do it well. And the state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms are <clears throat> deep learning methods, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, they are deep learning methods um, that are, are attention-based models for those of you who may be um, more familiar with those. Um, so, so we, <clears throat> my goodness, my throat has just decided to uh, get something stuck. Let me just drink something. Okay, uh, so, so we take the following approach um, towards um, stance detection, we start out um, by doing something that we call knowledge mining, um, where we identify what we think are tokens, words and phrases that are distinguishable for our two candidates, for the support and for the positive and negative um, that we're looking for. Um, and and that, is, that is the key part to, to our approach. I'll talk a minute about that uh, in, in a slide or two. Uh, then um, we uh, pre-train a language model um, with a normal um, mask language modeling. Uh, our pre-training was done on 5 million English tweets related to the presidential election. Um, then uh, we force a, a second pre-training that uses a uh, focus that focuses in on the tokens that we determined were stance relevant, meaning that they are indicative of, of certain stance towards individuals. Um, we then uh, fine tune to our specific downstream task of classification. And then we do an evaluation on hand labeled um, data. Okay, so um, just to go to this um, distinguishable words, the question we're asking is, are there words that really are connected to um, posts that are supportive versus posts that are opposing uh, each of the candidates? And if we can find those distinguishable words, maybe we can use them to improve our stance detection. And what we found was that using logs odds ratio for words was a very good technique um, for determining, um, the, for identifying these stance words. So basically what this does is for each word, it computes a probability score of the word being in either the pro-Biden um, uh, or the pro-Trump corpus. And it does this by using um, uh, word frequency. So if we think about this, we're gonna take these tweets that are hand labeled, that are supportive and opposing. We're gonna put them through this logs odds ratio algorithm. We're gonna have these ranked lists and then using these ranked lists, we're gonna decide on our final set of stance tokens to put into uh, our model. Uh, we ended up hand labeling uh, 1,250 tweets for each candidate. We had mechanical turf workers annotate each tweet and we took the majority vote. If there was more no majority, we uh, discarded the tweet. 
Uh, and and we uh, basically, you can see here that we have fairly even distributions in terms of um, class labels for each of our tweets, and we had very high inter-rater reliability. So um, so our ground truth uh, is is pretty um, was pretty reasonable for this analysis. Um, so uh, so we computed during the debate, we computed stance for uh, 1.3 million tweets that contained the debate hashtag. Uh, we created something called an aggregate stance score. That's a minute by minute score that took the number of tweets that were identified as supporting of a candidate and subtracted the number of tweets that were identified as opposing the candidate and divided that by the total number of tweets that were uh, labeled with a stance uh, in that particular minute. And, um, and this is what we found. So, so this is uh, the x-axis here shows each minute during the debate, starting from uh, the hour prior to the debate. Um, and the y-axis shows that stance um, uh, score that I just mentioned to you, the aggregate stance score. The red here is Trump and the blue is Biden. So we see prior to the debate, the uh, conversation is mostly negative, is, all, is, is mostly negative for both candidates. And during the debate, um, uh, it changes for Biden, where the conversation gets more and more positive. Um, when, they, when they are mean to each other, it gets more negative. Um, and, but in general, um, Biden does pretty well, even after the debate ends, there's a, a fair amount of positive conversation about him. Um, uh, Trump's best point was when he discusses judges um, and, and his Supreme Court um, uh, picks or, or, or talking about the Supreme Court. Um, and so, so I think it's really interesting to get this type of a, a glimpse into the public's or the Twitter population's um, discussions that are taking place because for those who might be looking at Twitter for information, you get a sense of what type of information they might be seeing if they're following a general debate, um, uh, a general debate um, hashtag. Okay, now I'm going to move to um, the final piece of my of my talk today, which is on misinformation. Um, I don't need to say that misinformation is everywhere. I think we all are well aware. Um, and I don't even need to say that prominent individuals are supporting misinformation because um, if you ever look at the US news, um, uh, it, it is clear that that, that is also the case. Um, but what we were interested in understanding is uh, what, what role do candidates have when they uh, make false statements? And so we, we started out um, thinking about presidential debates and presidential debates are these big public spectacles that people watch and um, they, they set the media agenda. Um, they, uh, uh, the candidates themselves tell truths and falsehoods, and um, all of this information gets shared across different platforms um, that we have. So, um, so we were interested in focusing in on uh, the lies, um, the falsehoods, um, as uh, identified by different fact checkers. And we focus in on three well-known fact checkers um, to determine whether or not uh, a particular statement is true or false. Um, okay, so we've talked about surveys. Um, we've talked about Twitter. Uh, we also have other types of uh, misinformation. Well, oh, sorry, sorry. I thought I had a different slide next. Okay, um, so, so what questions are we going to answer? Um, number one, uh, what false and misleading statements are mentioned during either debate that, uh, that gain traction during the campaign season? Um, 
How is misinformation from the debates reflected across modes of the media and what media streams um, did discuss these claims? Um, did they grow? Did they not grow? We're very interested in understanding how elite rhetoric spreads through the media and how um, attention is drawn to these pieces of misinformation uh, for ordinary citizens. Um, we would expect, I think, that uh, when political leaders um, mention misinformation during the debate, that uh, the discussion about that misinformation would be more salient in um, the public. And then finally, what topics from the debate made an impression on the, on the public? If there's a lot of different misinformation that's shared, people won't remember all of it. Uh, what pieces of it uh, are they capturing? So we're thinking about the misinformation, we're thinking about the spread, and we're thinking about which pieces of that misinformation spread actually remain in the public's memory. Um, we've already talked about two sources of information, Twitter and our surveys. Uh, let me add in a couple more. Um, we also had a newspaper data set where we collected um, over 700 newspaper or articles from over 700 newspapers across all the states in the U.S. Um, and that led to about 227,000 articles. We had national newspapers, uh, regional newspapers, and uh, local newspapers as well. And then we also had television transcripts from all the major um, news stations through that time period. Uh, this particular study will focus in on news channels um, since we're interested in, in when people might be uh, listening to news. Okay, so what's our methodology? So we start out, we identify false claims using our uh, fact checkers. Um, we then categorize those false claims into different topics. Uh, we had 14 topics that we investigated. We curated a misinformation dictionary. This curation was done manually, identifying different types of phrases that were associated with those false claims. Uh, we measured the misinformation-related discussion across all the different media streams I mentioned, right? So we had um, Twitter, we had newspapers, we used a subset of those that had a, at least a minimum number of articles, um, and we have our transcripts. Again, we're focusing in on, on news organizations. And then remember, we're going to can now use our survey to measure public recollection of misinformation. So which pieces and streams of misinformation were the ones that people mentioned when they talked about what they remembered about either candidate? Okay, so let's look across our different media streams at some of the top themes. And my header tells you what the top themes tended to be across streams. One was election integrity, one was uh, Biden personal attacks. So we look at newspaper, um, newspapers, 34% of the misinformation stream was about election integrity, 27% about Biden personal attacks, and 9% about uh, climate. If we look at Twitter, uh, the first two are very comparable, and taxes is the third one. And if we look at cable news, uh, Biden personal attacks is actually the most um, prominent one. That includes the main the main personal attack on Biden was Hunter Biden, um, and and so that includes um, things related to mostly Hunter Biden. Election integrity um, is are things about um, the election being rigged, mail in ballots um, having problems, dead people voting, uh, things like that. Um, but again, we focused in on only those uh, particular pieces that were mentioned in the debate. Um, so if it wasn't mentioned in the debate, but it still had to do with different types of um, attacks or, in, or election integrity, we do not include that uh, as, part of, as part of this particular example. Um, okay, so um, the two top claims uh, were myths categories were, were prevalent across all these streams, and, and then you have some distant categories um, after that. Um, 
so so I want to look at at each of these categories really quickly. Um, Pre-debate, post-debate one, post-debate two, um, and and I think our our question was first. If you look at this, you know, do you see that um, the debate is really um, always changing the discussion and increasing the discussion potentially? Um, and what we find there are two, I think, really important takeaways here. Uh, if you study this and you do correlations, you will see that um, there is a connection between uh, debate attention and media attention and prominence in, in public awareness that exists. Um, these square sizes uh, focus in on the uh, prominence um, of the surveys men uh, mentioning some of these topics. Um, so so I, think, I think that is true. But I think there's also a second thing that's important here too, which is um, just because it's mentioned in a debate or something false is mentioned in a debate, it doesn't necessarily catch on, right? So if we look at most of these topics, um, the public does not recollect uh, most of them as the primary things that they remember hearing about the candidate or what the candidate said. And so, so I think both of those uh, things are very important takeaways um, from this particular um, graphic. And, and so, so another way to think about that is to say um, debates and media attention may be necessary um, for the public to become aware, but um, either one alone doesn't guarantee that the public uh, will become aware. Um, okay, so um, looking at this on the open-ended responses through time, uh, we focus in on those uh, misinformation themes and topics, uh, and we see that uh, when we look at Trump's open-ended open responses about Trump, uh, election to integrity is mentioned a lot early on. Um, it sort of goes away a little bit, and then after the second debate, it really comes back. And there was more focus on that uh, by Trump in the second debate than in the first debate. If we look at, at Biden, um, there's not a whole lot of discussion about election integrity until the very end. But um, there, you know, these attacks that were, uh, uh, these attacks on Hunter Biden, um, they started early in the summer. They were amplified in the first debate, um, and they continued to be amplified um, by media sources after that first debate. <clears throat> and uh, they were again mentioned in the second debate, and, and we see that it stays prevalent um, uh, through, throughout the remainder of the debate um, season. If we look at the influence on Twitter conversation, um, we see Biden on the top uh, diagram and Trump on the bottom diagram. Um, we actually see that there is less uh, coherent influence on, um, on Twitter uh, than there was on, on uh, the surveys. Um, and, and I think one thing that's interesting here is you do see on Twitter a wider range of um, misinformation topics peaking at different times, uh, like this uh, light green one here for Trump, for example, is taxes, uh, and that that one does um, come up uh, on Twitter more. So, um, kind of finishing my thought out on on misinformation, um, <clears throat> we're in an environment um, where. Uh, information, we're in an information environment um, that is just saturated with different types of misinformation being spread by political elites, um, both on traditional media and on social media. And in some sense, it's contributing to the acceptance of these false narratives. Um, and so, um, so misinformation may stick without elites 
but um, it sticks more when elites um, are involved in that misinformation conversation. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, this is a compounding problem and um, debates can really uh, be used to distort the truth in ways that um, maybe other forums um, can't be uh, manipulated as easily. Okay, so a few final thoughts that I have. Um, first, uh, these findings just give you kind of a glimpse into the messaging and language that sticks with voters and uh, colors their assessment of candidates during the 2020 campaign. Um, coronavirus clearly dominated conversation about uh, Trump. Um, Biden's conversation was much more typical of a traditional campaign. Uh, I, I showed you that in the context of surveys, but that was also um, true um, on our other streams with the exception of um, uh, Hunter Biden. Um, that, was, that was something that grew um, along with uh, throughout the campaign season. Um, misinformation is here to stay. Um, it has an influence on elections and we need to really understand that influence and understand how to um, intervene uh, to, to reduce its influence. Um, if we think about data science for a moment, um, I, I think uh, what I hope you can see is that there are really interesting ways to use um, large scale data and, and algorithms um, for understanding different types of behavior, um, real time behavior, and even uh, for helping with decision support and evidence-based forecasting. Um, clearly, when you're trying to do decision support and evidence-based forecasting, you'd have to think about the measurement properties more. Uh, you can't use Twitter to tell you about general public opinion on uh, in the US without weighting it in some smart way. Um, so we do need to think about projects that link data streams and understand the measurement properties that exist across different data streams so we can generalize um, beyond the one data stream. And this is super vital given that uh, survey response rates continue to decline and we're not, it's not completely clear who's being missed in the survey responses. Um, data quality and algorithm transferability, transferability um, need to be better understood. Uh, computer scientists don't, and I'm a computer scientist, so I can say this, don't do a great job of, of telling people when they should not use an algorithm. Uh, and so we need to think about, um, about being smarter with uh, recommending different types of algorithms for different types of data sets um, in the presence of different types of, of uh, data quality issues like missing values and so on. Um, and of course, we need to continue to spend time thinking about the ethics of using these data sources and the privacy implications for individuals. Um, the data that we uh, use, we only focus on um, Twitter because it's open and we believe that people who post on Twitter um, realize that everybody can see their posts on Twitter. Uh, we focus on aggregate um, types of analyses, um, but we really are concerned about ethic, the ethics of using these types of data sources and we uh, want to be leaders in engaging um, and following best practices with that respect. I would like to first give the opportunity for people in the public to ask, so you can do so by raising your hand and opening your mic, uh, or writing directly uh, in the chat if you have any questions. Monisali. Hey, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this enlightening presentation. I'm a master's student in the University of Zadla, and I do similar work, currently doing my thesis in a very similar sort of a topic which you have so nicely shared. And my, my question pertains to, uh, it's more like, it's more, it speaks to more like the, your experience in this area. In, in the sense, like, I saw like, when you did like this topic over time thing for Hillary Clinton, like there was some topic which was like, uh, which featured quite consistently. And that immediately like brought this idea to my mind. 
and so this is more to do with, with like your experience in the field and as a budding researcher, maybe it could take some pointers from it. So if I were to sort of, because I see, uh, if I were to sort of look at the users who actually are responsible like for that sort of a topic to sustain, intuitively like one could argue that it is probably like the Republican users who would have that sort of a topic who would be speaking about that more. And about this, so this, the question then is it is about data reliability in the sense, because while we see like the surveys, it's generally the, 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 the people who would actually answer questions and help us to gather data there. We, we, don't re, we don't really have to face things like bot activity and the sort of foreign actors, but on Twitter, as we see like in recent works, especially like I believe there is a paper related to the 2016 election and the Russian bot activity really going up. So there's also the question of like, in, in, in terms of like the data quality of the tweets, I know like even location isn't like really a factor because people can easily like do a VPN and stuff. So for researchers who look at the same the, the analysis which you presented, but to sort of dig deeper at the user level, what would you suggest us like to how do we like do that analysis? Because what I see generally is like people look at like the blue tick, you know, these big, uh, big, big short accounts, the people who follow them and then the who follow them and this sort of a network sort of a thing to get a seed account and then have like a, a sets of accounts who one would sort of like look at and then compare like in, in, in a very like, I would say rudimentary sort of a setting if these were created recently and they're not bots. So yeah. how, how, how would you, could you please share some insights? Yeah, so, um, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think there, there are a lot of interesting parts to it. So, so first, um, uh, I don't think you can rely on any single data stream. Um, and so that is one of the reasons that I think our project has really focused on having a lot of different streams and understanding the biases associated with each one. So we have a representative sample um, for the for the 2016 analysis. Uh, Gallup, the Gallup tracking uh, poll and the question were actually asked daily, so it was even a more granular analysis. And um, and I think um, I think it was really really interesting how um, email was was irrespective of whether you were Republican, Independent, or a Democrat. Um, it was the prevalent topic that people remembered at certain points. Like when the Comey announcement happened, everybody said that that's what they remembered about her, right? It wasn't something else. Even if you were a Democrat, that was the thing you remembered or heard about in the last few days. What I didn't show you about the 2016 analysis that I think is an interesting thing to note is if you follow the Twitter analysis uh, at that same time period, like just kind of the temporal analysis, and I guess... There's a plug for the book. If you want to look in the book, that analysis is in there. Um, email was not dominant on Twitter, actually, as it works out. There were other things that were dominant, and there were many, you know, Crooked Hillary and other things too, but, but it wasn't email that was dominant there or in the newspapers. It was not dominant either, but still it stuck with people's minds. Now, at that time in 2016, we didn't have television um, streaming that we were doing uh, in later years, and we weren't looking at quite as many newspapers and things. So, so it may be different. Um, to get to your point about bots and biases and so on, I in in user level analysis, I think you have to think about what question you're asking. So, if you take our stance analysis. We actually wanted to know what the public is reading when they're looking at Twitter at that time, every minute, what are they seeing? So we wanted bot activity in there. If the bots were winning for one candidate versus the other candidate, we actually wanted to know that because we wanted to know what it was that the conversation was. A separate analysis would actually do a comparison of the bots to the humans. And that is something that you know we've done for different analyses. We didn't do it for that debate analysis, but we think that that can be really telling to actually look at both of those. Um, and so so I am a firm believer in um, in looking at at bots and removing them from many analyses. If you are doing public opinion of users, so you really are focused on understanding a user level metric, then I do think you need to remove bots. You need to 
um, do certain uh, inferences using profile information that is public uh, as to their location and perhaps as to uh, one or two other demographics that can be meaningful. Um, and so I do think for social science research, that's, that's important. Uh, and I don't necessarily believe everything has to be from a seed and a network. I actually would argue that it's better to try to pull random individuals from something like a deca hose um, and then um, and then try to assess where they are. We have a project called the Mosaic Project. And in that project, we have um, uh, people who are filling out a public opinion survey who have consented to letting us also watch them on Twitter and um, and uh, use their accounts to improve our social science and computer science knowledge. Um, and so part of that project for us is actually under, is not only comparing uh, what they say on Twitter or what, what this populate compared to their open-ended responses that they might answer, it's also comparing them to a random deca hose sample to see how similar and different they look and what types of things we have to consider on the deca hose to identify people versus bots and those that are in the US versus not and things like that. So we think a lot about those questions and I think social scientists who use these different sources of information to do uh, broad analyses of, of public opinion and behavior do need to um, engage in that. So thanks for the question, Muniz Alice. Um, Kai uh, was second in line for a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, hi, um, I'm Kai. I um, work at the European Central Bank. And I had a question concerning um, your one slide where you're comparing over the debate, how the sentiment changes towards uh, Trump and uh, Biden. And if you look at the graph, I found it quite astounding. You were explaining that the sentiment was quite negative before the debate started. And then over the course of the debate, um, Biden actually got quite a positive sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, and what I noticed was that um, you have some arrows that hint towards certain topics being debated in the uh, during the debate and there's no arrow at the point where suddenly Biden gets a better um, sentiment score. So it's it's actually also happening very early on in the debate. So I was wondering whether you did a little bit of investigation on potential reasons why the sentiment is changing for Biden at the beginning of the debate. Yeah, so so two things. One, it was stance, not sentiment. So I want to make that distinction because stance um, is 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 more difficult to measure, but I think it's more accurate. Um, so uh, that that is a, a a great question, and um, and I believe um, I did know the answer to that at one point, but I, I I'm now forgetting. If I remember correctly, um, it wasn't. Um, as so so it's not that he was um saying much at that point it was that um he was being attacked by trump but he was handling it in a very kind of you know mature way um and i think that was the point where he went up um and you'll notice that that same point trump goes down uh and and it's because of that type of not, you know, his part was mostly nonverbal, but um, Trump's part was not. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have another question in the chat that I will uh, maybe allow myself to, to summarize a little bit. So uh, the question is about the performance of uh, topic modeling, especially when the text are, uh, the, the, the corpus is small. But also what would happen if the text, uh, each document was very long, as for example, a transcript from a, a TV uh, TV program? Yeah, great. Um, so, um, so if you don't have at least a certain number of examples, all generative topic models will fail because um, they're generative, unless they're seeded. Um, because a seeded topic model means, okay, I know a few words from a few topics that I'm interested in, and I'm really just looking to see if there's any more words and if there's any topics I'm missing, as opposed to really focusing in on 
um, the specifics of the words themselves. So that will give you hints, um, but it won't it won't be as good. I mean, the generative models require a certain level of data. For long things like um, television transcripts, we actually, um, the particular uh, uh, corpus that we used um, segmented it based on breaks and other things. So, um, so generally each um, component um, was a few minutes long. It wasn't like the whole half hour. Um, and so that made that uh, a little bit easier because remember when you're uh, assigning topics, you don't assign a single topic, you assign all the topics that are discussed um, and it can be done proportionally. So you can get a sense of what the variation of topics were. Um, if you happen to have long documents, um, you they will tend to be less noisy anyways. Um, LDA, for example, works very well on scientific articles. I think it, it's a very good thing where uh, these topic noise models can be more helpful is where you're looking for subtopics within a domain, right? So if I was just applying a topic model to Twitter broadly, um, I would have sports and election politics and, and, and topics that really are fairly distinct and it would probably be pretty clear. But when I want to look at election dynamics and I want my subtopics to be related to elections, that means there's going to be a lot more noise in this space. And in those types of um, analyses, a topic noise model can be really useful. Okay. Not wanting to abuse your generosity in coming to our workshop and maybe abusing uh, my position of host a little bit, I want to close with one question. Okay. Uh, what would you would think about um, comparing uh, the outcomes of the analysis you made by, by, by considering different sources of fact-checking, in particular fact-checking from different uh, political slants? Um, I don't know if there's something that it's easy to come by uh, data-wise, uh, for example. And what would you think are would be the the thing that would stand in terms of what people what stays uh, from fake news on people's mind? Yeah. Um, so so I think uh, that's a great question, um, and uh, I think it would be very so. So Google has an aggregator um, that uh, aggregates claims and facts from a lot of different sources. Um, and we have been uh, developing a tool that uses a broader range of those sources to understand uh, you know, what the conversation, how it connects to conversation on different social media platforms. So um, in that case, one might find, oh, a particular um, fact checker with this slant actually tends to be dominant in conversation on this platform, you know, Truth Social or Parler or whatever other platforms, you know, Twitter. Um, and so, so I think the answer to your question is yes, totally doable. Um, very insightful and important to do because uh, what people perceive as a reliable fact checker really differs depending upon what, what part of the country or world you, you live in. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much again to the speaker, the host, and everybody who asked questions. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks and bye-bye. <laughs>